right, you curious, you courageous hurly burlyites. I'm very chuffed about this podcast, not only because it's rare that he gives interviews these days, but because I think it's going to be a hell of a conversation with a man who was one of the preeminent politicians of his time. Gary Albert Dewar, the 20th Premier of Manitoba, joins us today. Mr. Dewar spent exactly a decade holding that office, leading his NDP to three consecutive majority governments. His list of accomplishments is long and broad, but notable were investments in public health care, education and infrastructure, and balanced budgets during each of those 10 years. In 2005, Business Week named him as one of the top 20 international leaders on climate change. In 2009, Mr. Dewar succeeded Michael Wilson as Canadian Ambassador to the United States, serving until 2016. Today, he's a senior business advisor at Denton's, working at the intersection of business, public policy, and cross-border trade relations. But perhaps even more compelling than all of that, if you scroll all the way down to the bottom of Mr. Dewar's Wikipedia page, you'll find a small photo of him holding court at the 2023 U.S.-Canada Summit, hanging just off of his right shoulder, a shaggy-haired admirer and podcast host, probably trying to secure this very interview. <laughs> so thank you for including me in your Wikipedia entry, and it's a great honor to have you on the Hurley Burley today. Thanks for making the time. Well, Mr. thank you very much, uh, David. I uh, Excellent branding as usual, Hurley Burley. That's a <laughs> terrific brand. You still got it. You still put the proverbial puck in the net, so that's good. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks very much. So listen, can you believe Wab Canoe is the Premier of Manitoba? Yes, I, I mean, can. I mean, it's so amazing. I don't know if people outside the prairies can understand the significance of this. But growing up in Regina in the 1970s and 1980s, there wasn't much that was less plausible to me than that an Indigenous person would ever be the Premier of a province. Well, I, I thought, you know, he's, I knew him before he ran for office. Uh, he was obviously involved in CBC, and then he was involved in the University of Winnipeg. Uh, my daughter worked in the summer at a, at a program called WASAC, was an Aboriginal inner city program uh, in her summer, uh, summer job. So I knew about him then. Uh, I'm pleased that he became leader of the party when uh, Greg Salinger stepped down. And of course, Brian Pallister was elected. Uh, I wasn't pleased with that, but uh, he was elected. <laughs> Bless his soul in Costa Rica as we speak. Yeah. And uh, and so I, I was really pleased he took a run at it uh, to win and he came short in his first election, which is not unusual. So all of us have done some of that uh, character building uh, through defeat. And he uh, then became premier. And I think he ran a terrific campaign, very disciplined, hired very smart people uh, to uh, make sure that he ran. But he ran as the happy candidate. And you and I both know uh, whether it's Ronald Reagan or Bill Clinton or Barack Obama or Brian Mulroney or Jean Chrétien, uh, happy people are more uh, effective, I think, on political campaigns. If you're angry, you lose. If Especially happy, in their first one. What's that? Especially yes. in their first one. Yes, that's yeah. exactly right. <laughs> all. all right. So let's get right. Let's get. No, but wait, just follow up on that. Yeah. That wouldn't have happened in Manitoba in the 1980s. Wab would not have been even thought of in the 1980s. So what's happened? Well, we did have uh, in our government uh, and in Howard Pauley's government before, he recruited a guy named Elijah Harper. You may have mm. heard of him. Yeah. I and he and I were sworn into cabinet together. Uh, I recall that day. Uh, and I also re recall some of the discussions when we were together on a Meech Lake task force with a guy named Jim Carr, a person named Jim McRae, the Attorney General of Manitoba under Philman. Uh, we worked hard when we ran uh, for office in 1999. Uh, we had an Inuit speaker that we were able to elect. Uh, we had two Cree uh, members of our caucus uh, appointed to cabinet, one on the west side of Lake Winnipeg, a guy named Oscar Lathlin, who built the whole town of Paw uh, 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 complex, business complex, uh, and then a guy named Eric Robinson, who actually worked with Peter Mansbridge in, in, uh, for the CBC up in Churchill years before. So that's, I'm name dropping, 
But my daughter accuses me of having a sore back from all picking up all the names I dropped. So you might have some more today. But uh, <laughs> I think that laid the groundwork for really competent, capable people. Um, the uh, the Salinger government had an excellent uh, cabinet minister, was uh, an Aboriginal cabinet minister, Métis cabinet minister, who was minister of economic uh, development. His name is Kevin Chief. He's very sought up after by the business community. Uh, so it, there was some of that being developed, uh, but it certainly didn't have the profile and the historical significance of WAB, the first First Nations person in Canada to be elected as premier of a province. And we're very proud of him. And having had some experience in Washington with a guy named Barack Obama, I think there's a little bit of that for the young people, young Aboriginal people. Uh, I think it, it's a really strong message. If you put your mind to it, you can do it. And I've shown, you know, basically Wab has shown it can be done. And I think that's a great inspiration for a lot of youth. I think that's important. Cool. So let's switch to you. You grew up in Winnipeg, 1950s, yes. 1960s, right? Yeah, I was born before then, uh, but uh, grew up basically in the 60s. Yeah. Uh, sold popcorn at Bomber Games uh, so I could see the team play, especially against your beloved Rough Riders. It usually came down to the Bombers and the Rough Riders in those days. Yeah. Uh, and the Eskimos, i got to be honest, which is no longer called the Eskimos. The Elks. And, uh, of course, uh, I, I, it was a great honor to do that. We all love Bud Grant. I say that because you never know what's going to happen in life. So later on, I'm premier, and I get to present uh, an award to Bud Grant because one of, he's one of two people at the time that has got the CFL and NFL Hall of Fame. And it gives me a Viking helmet. And, you know, I'm just like, I could hardly speak to the guy. I'm so honored to be sitting beside him at this dinner. Yeah. And he gives me a Viking helmet. And he says, it's a little big because all you politicians have swollen heads. <laughs> and, and, and probably correct. And I took it to Washington when I became ambassador. And little did I know, Amy Klobuchar from Minnesota, his father was the sports reporter for the Vikings in Minneapolis. And then the guy named uh, from a guy from Stillwater, Minnesota, was the chief of staff for Barack Obama. A guy named Dennis McDonough, who was now in the cabinet, was veteran affairs minister. They saw the Viking helmet, so I I didn't have to do any persuasion with uh, people on the hill because I had Bud Grant's helmet on there, my ambassador's desk. There you go. You were obviously 60s, somebody. Sixties experience of selling popcorn at the bomber game, get him free. Yeah. Comfortable childhood. Hey, pardon. Did you have a comfortable childhood? Yes, I did. Paper route. You know, I learned you hustled. You know, it was a hustling community. All my brothers, my friends, we all had all kinds of small jobs and that we hustled on. And, uh, and we had good friendships and uh, we enjoyed ourselves uh, riding around on our bikes and going to play hockey and uh, baseball. And we, I played all sports. My dad said to me, you're going to be uh, you're going to be a, a master of none playing all the sports. You should focus in on one or two. He was probably right, but I I like to be on the teams. Yeah, that was the back in the days of the multi sport athlete. Everybody played everything back then. Yeah, I I, yeah. I didn't get bigger earlier in life, so I was pushed around more when I was younger than I was pushed around later in life. But that's <laughs> that's the way it works. Yeah, I don't recall people pushing you around very much. Uh, so. Your route into politics went through the union movement. You actually got involved in the union movement before you got involved in politics. Am I correct about that? That's right. I was working part-time when I was going to university at a youth uh, dissension center. Uh, and uh, when I was there, they offered me a full-time executive job. Uh, so I had to decide to step down from my studies to take this job, which I really enjoyed. And then I went to a union meeting one time and spoke up and I got appointed to some reorganization committee and then, be, you know, later became vice president and then president of the union. So I, I found a great experience and learning how to negotiate and understanding what leverage is and isn't. I felt uh, over my years of different jobs, including premier and ambassador, it's a great, uh, that is a great experience to understand you know, not to believe your own bluff, you know, to, to make sure you have leverage in, in all kinds of uh, negotiations. Right. Interesting. Interesting. So then how did that morph into 
active involvement in elected politics? Were you recruited or did you come to some epiphany that you needed to do this? How did you get involved in the NDP as a candidate? Well, well, first of all, when I was president of the union, when I was vice president of the union, I signed my first political card, uh, a guy named Michael Decker. You might know him. I think I he do. was, I think I he was He's a, a nonpartisan um, health uh, advisor. Yes, very yeah. nonpartisan, just like, yeah. just like I was. And I, he, I signed my first card and I worked on a campaign when I was vice president of the union. But I very much believe when you were president of the union, uh, the organization should be political, but be nonpartisan. So I had a great number of experiences with politicians in the legislature. Um, we uh, disagreed with the uh, wage and price control and actually took but just wait, to just wait. The, the NDP and the union movement are formally tied. So why did you feel that way? Yes, but a lot of the private sector unions are formally tied and pays paid dues, paid dues. Sometimes they do now uh, to the NDP, uh, but the public sector unions, I strongly believe public sector unions should be led by people that are politically aware, but nonpartisan uh, because the employer is actually the government. So when I was dealing with uh, issues like the cup, uh, the government selling, Manitoba Public Insurance Corporation. Uh, I was president of the union and having a di major disagreement with the conservative government of the day. And then a couple of months later, I negotiated the first dental plan in the province with the same conservative government. And I do believe, I did strongly believe at the time that I was president, we shouldn't have a partisan connection, but we should be very politically active with all political issues. And I had I remember calling uh, the NDP white wine socialists when they laid off a lot of people. Now, I was doing that to get a headline and stop the layoffs. Um, but people read, anytime you're in the newspaper going one way or the other, they read you to be very political. But uh, we were nonpartisan. And I, I still believe that today. So the public sector union movement, at least in Ontario and federally, has been pretty active in the last decade or so, or two decades, about defeating conservatives. You think that's wrong? I think it's important uh, to tell it like it is, issue by issue, principle by principle, and not give away your power by being perceived to be a, uh, an adjunct to a political party in the public sector. That, I believe that. Uh, now, there's very effective public sector unions across the country that do their own thing. But I remember negotiating a waiver on the Buy American provision when I was uh, ambassador and we were the only country to be able to negotiate. And partly the reason for that was we were very much, we had a really strong union movement in Canada. For example, Leo Gerard, of course, from Ontario, was head of the Steelworkers Union in Pittsburgh, and one third of his members were Canadian. And what they were gonna lose their jobs over Buy America. So when we slowly with then Vice President Biden and then Nancy Pelosi negotiated a waiver uh, when I was working for the Harper government, uh, we negotiated a waiver for Canada, uh, and it was because of the unions. And uh, people like Biden had a good relationship with the hard hats in, in Pennsylvania. And the public sector unions in Ontario came out against it. Now, that, their job wasn't at stake. Their plant wasn't going to close. Their operation didn't close. Now, I'm biased because I was a public sector union president, but I was very concerned that, you know, just taking a kind of... Uh, uh, how should I describe it? Uh, Pavlov's dog approach to these issues really didn't take into account the people that would have lost their jobs if we wouldn't have preserved the supply chain north and south at the time. All right. Let's do a short recap, shall we? We've been talking investment in this space for weeks now on behalf of our presenting sponsor, TELUS. Continual investment. Because an innovation economy can't innovate without it. Keep up or die. To wit, the telecom industry invests more than $10 billion annually. That's the third highest level of capital investment per capita in the OECD. The OECD. It's kind of a big deal, Hurley Burleyites. So what does it get us? I mean, beyond faster speeds, broader coverage, and more capacity than most of the rest of the world. Innovation driven by digital connectivity was responsible for almost 20% of Canada's labour productivity growth from 2009 to 2019. That's more here than in the US. 
According to StatsCan, telecommunications generated $48 billion in GDP in 2021, about 2.2% of our national economy. And as we continue to grow the digital economy, our GDP grows with it, an estimated additional $77 billion by 2035. All of this in an environment where prices for wireless products and services have decreased significantly over the last five years. Name another thing in your life where prices have decreased lately while quality has gone way up. I'll wait. Anyway, not to put too fine a point on it, but TELUS only wants to continue to invest in ways that support an innovation agenda, improve their offerings, and the lives of Canadians who use them. But as I've been saying, that can only happen under regulatory conditions that make those investments make financial sense. As it stands, we're on the precipice of that not being the case. More next time. So I want to take you up 30,000 feet because you led a government for a decade. Yes. And so it's a question that you must have thought about a lot. What is the role of government in our society? What's the job? Well, first, first of all, I, I strongly believe in political parties that support the floor for all people, all Canadians. There's a basic floor, health care, education, uh, human rights. There's a basic floor. I don't believe the government should impose a ceiling. I've always believed in, you know, a combination of a floor for people that need it and a kind of a reach for the heavens for those who are able to do so. And we can all benefit from that. So I start from a philosophy. I generally believe social democratic governments in say, in say the uh, Scandinavian countries have that basic philosophy. I saw it again. Uh, through the financial crisis when I was first in Washington. Now, we had the layoffs in Canada that they had in the United States. We had uh, a number of, you know, the markets fell, so we had real challenges on the pension plans, private and public in Canada and in the United States, very similar to the United States. But we had banking regulations. We did not have a situation where 40% of the people had lost values of their homes because partly because of the banking system. So there's an example where the enforcement and regulation in the Canadian banking system allow Canadians to at least escape one reality that the Americans went through. And ultimately that led to the organizations like the Tea Party and other protest groups in the States, which are still very apparent today in different forms. And so that's my philosophy in life. And I saw it manifested in, uh, in the uh, financial crisis in the, in the U.S., Right. Canada had an advantage because we had a floor. And how is that an advantage? How has the floor been managed? How is it an advantage? How it's is that an advantage? Ad you know, obviously having. I mean, it's a moral. It's a moral good, but you're describing as as a country as a national well, advantage. That, that, that it's beyond moral. It was an economic advantage. We had less people losing their homes. That that is an economic advantage. It's an also an advantage of dignity. Your home uh, or your property is so valuable to you, to your, yeah. your own individuality, your own family's uh, uh, flaw, uh, you know, beliefs in, in fairness. So, no, this is a huge economic advantage. I don't consider that, you know, love, trust, and pixie dust. I, I think this is all good economic advantages. Our health care system is both a moral advantage and an economic advantage. Our education system is similar to the United States, but I would argue uh, that the Americans have phenomenal universities, but the cost of going to universities is a moral issue in the United States. You come up with student debt over 72,000, thinking Canada is about 21,000, uh, but it's also an economic advantage in Canada uh, to have uh, that of affordability of our post-secondary educational facilities. And that when you combine that also with provincially run and operated colleges uh we're second only to germany with the ability to have apprenticeship programs and trade programs again which are both an is both a moral advantage because it gives youth more choices but it's also an economic advantage and i i like the statement of tony blair uh that when he said the best economic strategy is an education strategy and i think that that is an economic strategy and an economic advantage yeah absolutely absolutely 
You ran nothing but balanced budgets. Why did you do that? Why did you think that was important? Um, was it situational because that's what was happening in the 1990s and early 2000s? Or is it a matter of principle with you about fiscal responsibility? Well, I always believed in, you know, if you if you could balance the budget, it was best to do it. I think Schreier uh, had six out of eight years of balanced budgets. It was, uh, Pauli had close to balanced budgets, but he, he certainly didn't have uh, the advantages we had. And some of that is situational, not uh, political. Uh, you look at Saskatchewan, you, you certainly know a, a guy named Alan Blakeney, and Roy, I certainly know an individual named Roy Romano, and of course, Tommy Douglas before them didn't start Medicare until the balance of the budget was balanced. And uh, so I think there's a certain Western Canadian populism on doing everything you can to run the right programs, but don't invest in them if you can't afford them. Right. Uh, in Tommy Douglas's case, though, I don't know that it was some sort of fiscal rectitude. He didn't want to pay interest to bankers, right? Well, that's a... Uh, that's that's an economic issue. Had a moral. I'm not going to. I'm not going to second, second guess a man of the cloth <laughs> ever. Uh, so there's a few issues. So there's a great memorial, by the way, for him at Brandon University for Tommy Douglas and uh, uh, and uh, uh, Woodsworth. So it's kind of a nice history. Yeah. There's a guy that doesn't get enough good press, Tommy Douglas. You know. I know. <laughs> He's the most famous Canadian. He beat, he beat a lot of good people in that blast contest. I got to tell you a super funny story for just one second. I had a friend named Davy Stewart, who used to be the leader of the Liberal Party in Saskatchewan, he was subsequently a senator. And when Tommy Douglas died, but he fought Davy as Ross Thatcher's right hand man, he fought Tommy Douglas through the 50s and everything. <laughs> and when Tommy died, he was being eulogized in the Senate. And everybody had nothing but great things to say to him. And somebody, one senator said, the man didn't have an enemy in the world. And Davy Stewart stood up and he said, Mr. Speaker, point of order, I was his enemy. <laughs> <laughs> well, good for him. Tommy would love to like that. I didn't know him well, but I certainly knew him from his history. So listen, there's some issues confronting this country that I just want to go through and get your perspective on about how we deal with them. And I want to start with climate change. Because it feels so intractable in this country. we It's vi dividing us very, very badly. It's dividing us on, regional, on a regional basis because we have regional economic interests that people want to protect. It's dividing us on a almost a class basis because there's affordability issues involved and people who are struggling with their monthly budgets aren't feeling like they want to pay more to combat climate change. Yet climate change is relentless and coming at us. How can we approach this issue more cohesively and effectively as a country? Well, I think it's, it's sometimes there's really low-hanging policy fruit that most people would agree with and want us to proceed with in a, in a, in a prudent way. Uh, for example, uh, you know, when we did the acid rain agreement, and Brian Mulroney was very involved in that, I, you know, that had that actually had a great contribution to reducing greenhouse gases as well as giving us cleaner air and less lung disease. And, you know, we have a situation now where methane gas is becoming a problem in North America. I think we should have an agreement with the United States on methane gas. And when you look at some of the best policies in the world on methane gas, they're in Saskatchewan and uh, Alberta, ironically, you know, people, the world bank, that's not my information. That's coming from an analysis of the world bank. <clears throat> so I think we should try to do some big things that all of us agree to. So I do believe people understand why Canada should be coal free. And I think we can do it because British Columbia is coal free by with hydropower. Ontario. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, we go, let's go across the country. Alberta is going to be coal free soon with the, the policies that have been put in place that I don't think anybody's, going to change them. Jason Kenney didn't. And, and I don't think the present premier will change that. Saskatchewan has great, I think you're going to have more uh, micro uh, nuclear sites in Saskatchewan. Uh, they've got uranium. 
but I think they could be coal free also with power from Manitoba. I think we, I did make a speech at the Empire Club that the Empire has no grid. Didn't, tr- I thought it was catchy, didn't get any coverage, but you know, I think <laughs> we're all selling power north and south instead of east and west. Right. And partly why we're doing it, not as just for the money, but also for the reliability of the grid. Uh, so Manitoba's coal free, Ontario's coal free, Quebec is coal free. Uh, it would be easy uh, to connect some hydro lines from Quebec and uh, Newfoundland and Labrador uh, to Atlantic Canada to have a strategy on um, making Atlantic Canada coal free. I'd like to see Canada be coal free. So all these other things that sound like, you know, university profs are coming, nothing against university profs. A lot of them supported me, <clears throat> but I think we should have some big vision that everybody can agree to instead of these nitpicking fights that are going on relentlessly across the country in the middle of a affordability crisis, which is legitimate. What do you do about the oil and gas sector? It's a, you know, it's, it's an economic advantage. Uh, the gas is displacing in the United States. Gas is displacing coal in the world. It's going to displace coal. We should be exporting more of our gas to displace coal. It's an economic advantage and a, and a climate advantage. Okay, but now, climate change advocates view gas as a bad thing. Yeah, because they argue that anything that's fossil fuel is bad. The coal, you know, the biggest reduction in, in greenhouse gases in the United States took place under Obama. And it took place with having coal being closed down for coal plants being closed down for gas. And that's good for Canada because coal obviously in the Midwest affects our air that we breathe. So yeah, it, it, I don't believe, I believe if we can reduce coal, that's a legitimate climate change obje- objective. Is it perfect? No, but we, you know, perfection is taking one step at a time to reduce greenhouse gases. And, you know, as I say, the, the acid rain agreement between uh, Brian Mulroney and Ronald Reagan, I, I understand that, the, the conversation with Ronald Reagan, I've heard this from Colin Powell. Uh, he was getting briefed on this issue and there it was on the one hand, you do this and the other hand, you do that. And people didn't want him to sign the acid rate agreement. He said, well, uh, and, and, and be part of any kind of issue on the environment. And he said, you know, I think it's good to buy insurance. Maybe it's just good. We do this because it's good insurance. If we don't know what, how it's going to end up. And you know, that's not a bad place to be. No, no prudence. Right. What if it's true? <laughs> yes. Well, it is. It is true. We, we got to keep working at it. But that was a good step forward. So our sponsor, CN, wants a few good women. Actually, more than a few. As you'd probably expect, railroading has been dominated by men for a couple of centuries. It remains so across the industry. But CN knows that women arrive with a different way of doing things, which is to say often a better way. The fact is, women have been a significant part of CN's fabric for a long time, just not always in what the railway calls the running trades, meaning the people who actually operate trains. There's no reason for that, other than that's how it's always been, and it is changing. Anyway, last week, to coincide with International Women's Day, CN brought together a group of women railroaders, stakeholders, and government officials at its training center in Winnipeg, where all new Canadian CN employees begin their jobs. Some of them are daughters and granddaughters of CN railroaders. Some are the first generation of what CN hopes will be a great many women railroaders. They went through simulators and training sessions and a demonstration of a derailment and all ended up taking a safety pledge. One of their instructors was a woman named Rebecca, who has made it a goal to help recruit women, train them, and check in on them along their career journeys. These women are breaking ground. CN is exceedingly proud of them. Oh, It's worth remembering here that for the first time in Canadian history, a Class 1 railway is being led by a woman, CN's own Tracy Robinson. And yes, indeed, she brought a new way of doing things to the job. How about health care? Yes. What is at the heart of our country's inability to deliver health care properly? The same issues that Romano tried to deal with in his report, the same issues that Paul Martin tried to deal with and his deal with the provinces in 2005 are with us today. Any election campaign in Canada is going to feature talk of hallway medicine, crowded ERs, 
no access to family doctors, waiting lists for essential procedures and for cancer treatment. We've been talking about these things for decades. I saw an article where you as Premier were talking about introducing nurse practitioners. We're still talking about doing that. So do we have to abandon the public model or can the public sector get figure out how to deliver health care? Well, they, they have to because there's no everything you've described is true. I was there with Prime Minister Martin uh, after the Romano report on health care. Uh, and, you know, I admire the fact it was in a public space televised, you know, so at least it was, uh, you know, wasn't, you know, I'm Monty Hall's from Winnipeg, let's make a deal, but it should be out in the open. And I thought that was wise to do it. It actually had a little bit of advantage for premiers because we actually deal with the hands-on part of healthcare. Usually most of us deal with our finance minister and our health minister at the end of the day before we table our budget because one is the high cost and one is the, uh, balancing the budget and those were all the decisions become notwithstanding the other departments and government um i i think that uh, you know some of what we're suffering was decades ago there was a report out of i think british columbia that said the best way to reduce health care costs was to reduce the number of uh, students enrolled in medical schools and that way you would have if you had less doctors you'd have less billings and if you had less billings you'd have less Left death, left less deficits in health, and you know. I, I remember the person's name, and I'm not going to repeat it. But it, it sort of went through, permeated through every government of every different political party as a way to cost money. I think I think we've got a real catch up job on the human resources side, on medical schools. Uh, I know we increased the size of the medical school. Brian Postel, who did work also for for Paul Martin, was dean of the medical school in Manitoba, uh, and. Uh, we, you know, nurses, we, we don't train enough nurses. We don't pay them enough. Uh, and, uh, and I think COVID in a lot of industries, whether it's the airline industry or the healthcare industry, uh, we just went through two years of just absolute abandonment of human resources. And people, you know, when they felt abandoned, they abandoned us. And uh, I like the fact that we're moving ahead with, selected immigration that can help us in this regard. I remember uh, trying to get nurses in areas when the Saudis kicked out the Filipino nurses, we, we went right over there shamelessly to get some yeah, more nurses. Yeah. Yeah. So, but it's, it's a human resource issue as well as a funding issue. And, uh, and we, we got catch up to do. We got real catch up to do. Apparently people don't want to practice family medicine in rural areas anymore. Uh, I hear differently. I, I think it is. The, I think part of, it, part of it is the rural area. What are the quality of life issues? I actually, I didn't get this through. You know, you, your premier, you think you can get stuff through. But we're trying to attract doctors to northern Manitoba. We have all these beautiful lakes and phenomenal, phenomenal, beautiful country. And I, you know, the PA, for example, they're short of family doctors. And I suggested to the hospital, why don't you build ten cottages ten miles away? at Clearwater Lake and use that as part of your recruitment. I think part, I think we got to use some common sense. Young people today, whether they're doctors or nurses, they want kind of outdoor activity. One of the great advantages of Canada is our space, our fresh air, our, our water, uh, fresh water, our, you know, the, the boreal forest that is close to all our cities. I mean, Winnipeg or Manitoba's got a hundred thousand lakes. We can't use that because the Americans in Minnesota, they got 12,000 lakes. And I don't want to get in a fight with Jesse, the body venture. He, might actually, <laughs> he actually might be running for with Kennedy nowadays, but um, I just cut water deals with him when I was. Either that or, yeah. yeah. When he was the Terminator, we cut water deals. But that was it. But um, so I think that we should be more creative in rural Manitoba. I think making it attractive to people, we should also have, a number of spots for students, high school students coming out of rural Manitoba in the medical school. And we tried to do that a bit, and I don't think it was successful. The intent was there. But uh, for once and for a while, we relied only on South African doctors in the rural in northern Canada, including Saskatchewan. It's probably more difficult to get into medical school from a, a rural high school than it might be from a city high school. Uh, it may be, but it, it should be the criteria that the provincial government funds 
the medical school. And it should be under the professional auspices of the medical profession and the university uh, that has the authority. But there should be public objectives in that enrollment as well. And there's lots of social public objectives, uh, but they should also be uh, part of that social objective should be uh, rural and northern communities. Hmm. But there's others that are already there. Do you care whether healthcare services are delivered publicly or privately? You know, it becomes uh, 90% of Canadians live within 60 miles of the American border. Uh, so if, if a person with money can get, you know, if they can't get, usually we're, we're, they're, we're just as good, if not better, on life and death timing as Americans. Where they exceed us in healthcare, and it's really important with a senior seniors population, is the quality of life procedures, the hips, the knees, the cataracts, the, you know, which could lead to uh, blindness. You know, they exceed us in that because you can get the procedures quicker in a private system. And I do think that uh, we've got to up our game uh, with uh, clinics. We, we funded something called the Pan Am Sports Medicine, and it was a hybrid. It has private research in the facility, uh, the people there go out and recruit doctors to do hip and knees and other things, working in conjunction with a public hospital called uh, Concordia uh, Hospital for to do those procedures. But it has a little bit, it doesn't have the same bureaucracy as the traditional healthcare system. And it has more agility uh, and, part, and they do get part of their, they're allowed to raise money uh, for the research foundation, their research foundation. Right. And of course, in all our hospitals, all our hospitals across Canada, there's massive fundraising efforts in the private sector to fund a lot of the capital investments with the name of, you know, Canada Life and, in the cancer care in Winnipeg or, yeah. you know, uh, I'm sure in Saskatchewan, there's a lot of other private companies that are, you know, are very involved in healthcare. Is that private or public? Was well, both. So I, I think we sometimes get, you know, I think we should use more common sense. We should have common sense on access, which is a fundamental principle, but uh, access could include a lot more flexibility in all of our areas of uh, healthcare delivery. Okay, so access. Greg Marshallton, whom I'm sure you know. Yes, he, he was the principal. He was the secretary of Romano's report. He was. He was also, an artic also an articling student to my brother, William. Um, okay. There you go. So I've known him for okay. some time. Greg yes. Marshallton told me that... Uh, that the uh, fundamental principle of Medicare was that the uh, next care goes to the person who needs it the most. Yes. How, how inviolable should that principle be? Well, the, first of all, the implementation of that principle is not the government, it's the doctors. And I trust doctors who are dealing with the air traffic control in the emergency ward more than I trust anybody else. And uh, their dedication, the nurses, the doctors in the, at the front door of healthcare are the ones that should make the decision. Uh, and of course, you, you think about these things. So when COVID hit, uh, and of course, we were all watching different media. When COVID hit, a place like Milan, the wealth, wealthy city in Italy, doctors were having to make decisions at that time about whether to give a ventilator to an older person who may die anyways, or a younger person who may live a lot longer. So uh, thankfully we, we had the uh, vaccine developed uh, soon thereafter and we didn't have to have these decisions, but I still think uh, those are horrible decisions for doctors to make, but I would rather they make them than uh, government. But in Saskatchewan, if I've got a couple of grand, I can jump the queue on an MRI. Yes. Is that okay? Uh, you could do it now. You could just drive to uh, Moose. Uh, you could just drive from Moose Jaw to uh, uh, Mile City, uh, Montana. You can do that now, right? But not within the Canadian system. I know. I mean, that. yeah, yeah, I know. I, I, I don't. I don't know the answer on the MRI in Manitoba. So I'm, uh, but I personally believe the MRI should go to the person who's in the most difficulty in healthcare. 
Yeah, that would I'm be just trying to new. understand. One of the things a lot of people are pushing, Premier, is this idea about we need a private stream. We need to relieve the pressure on the public system by allowing a for pay stream. I I do believe that that it's still best to have private involvement in funding healthcare, uh, providing the MRI machine, providing. Uh, the funding through fundraising, you know, you know, we get the Health Sciences Center Foundation in Winnipeg, all the major CEOs contribute to it, and the, but they get in the same line as everybody else. So you, we can get private money into the system. I have no difficulty with that. And there's a lot of charitable private companies that do that. And that's where I'd like to see the private investment in healthcare through the front door and then doctors decide who needs that procedure who needs that mri uh but i have no problem with somebody paying two thousand dollars to fund the mri that everybody would have access to so that's my uh dodgeball answer to your straight up question no it's not a dodgeball it's pretty good i'll take it so when you were in opposition yes as i recall it you kind of supported meach and you full-on supported charlottetown of course. Yes. Yes. Those were not winning positions in Manitoba. I so first of all, Meech. Uh, it was negotiated. Howard Pauly, my predecessor, was part of the decision making in, in the first room the, at Meech Lake, and then the second meeting in Langevin. Yeah. And uh, and created Sharon Carstairs in the process. A little later on, yes. Yeah. And. Uh, well, she was elected, but she certainly gave her a rocket under her yeah. political career. But uh, we, you know, Howard came back and got a standing ovation in the legislature. Uh, but we, but Elijah Harper, to his credit, uh, had informed our caucus that he was going to be, there was a, an Aboriginal meeting in the, the, either April or May, uh, Premier's meeting with the Prime Minister. And I think they blew it then by not having greater recognition uh, of uh, some of the issues that uh, Indigenous people were, were putting on the agenda. And so nothing happens. That meeting collapses with no progress. And two months later, they come out and have this distinct society. And I think that they made, you know, we made a mistake in that regard. So I was on a task force with a guy named Jim Carr. I was leader of the NDP, leader of the third party then. Uh, and uh, we, uh, we had hearings and we came up with an alternative. We came up with the Canada Clause. And uh, I say that because it remained in the Charlottetown Accord. And it would have, you know, the whole issue of the two, you know, the French and English uh, founding a Canada. But it would start with Aboriginal people. You know, we, we, we inherited the land of Indigenous people. Then there was the French and English, with, you know, the French with their distinct society. Then there was new immigrants in Canada, so we developed a Canada clause, and that was in the uh, that was in the Charlottetown Accord. But I didn't think it would, you know, at that point, prior to the Charlottetown Accord, I believe it was Jean Chrétien who said the next constitutional amendment would have to be uh, ha have a referendum. And I remember talking to somebody who was working for the federal government at the time. They said, "What are you going to do?" I said, I'm, "I support the Canada clause. I'm, I don't like your wording on." On the Senate, I think the Senate should be abolished, but I personally will support the Charlottetown Accord. At that time, though, I think there were three NDP premiers involved in it, Bob Ray, Roy Romano, and Mike Harcourt. I'm just going by memory. You wouldn't remember it better than I would. And uh, I remember telling one of these federal people who asked me about the, our rolling polls say it's going to pass. I said, well, my rolling nose says it's going to fail in Manitoba. <laughs> I'm, supporting, I, I'm supporting it, but... I don't think it's going to do that well. So what's, your, what's your idea of the country that made you support Charlottetown? I thought the Canada Clause was a superior draft of the constitutional amendment than Meech Lake. Because Meech Lake was a one-trick pony. It was very, very, uh, you know, it would have been very good for Quebec and very helpful to for unity. Uh, it wasn't a zero-sum exercise that the fact that it was defeated. I mean, we had calls from the former premier of Newfoundland and Labrador right to Elijah Harper directly in the middle of that debate. It was really 
uh, <coughs> quite fascinating. It was, and it was predicated on the fact that the government of the day put three constitutional amendments on the order paper when the rules require, allow only two. So Elijah Harper was able to stand up and he had, it was a slam dunk uh, uh, contest of the constitutionality of the then premier's uh, resolution on the order paper. And then we had a free vote. Uh, I voted for it, but we had a free, it, uh, the biggest challenge that I had and other people wanted to oppose Meech Lake because that was popular in their constituencies. And one of the biggest challenges we had is to keep it to Aboriginal issues and Elijah Harper and not have 10 people standing up objecting. We had one person with the eagle feather. And I think that that was not, but we had the toughest caucus I've ever been in, including in government on that issue. So what I've seen over the 35 years since then is a steady disengagement of Quebec from the rest of the country and an increasing isolation where it, 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 it almost operates in its own zone. Um, it has no interest in what the rest of the country thinks about its policies. Uh, and uh, it is, in almost every operating respect, a distinct society, is it not? Well, I, I, the 35 years, I would, would disagree with how you portray it. Because I had the privilege and pleasure of working with a guy named John Charest, who was elected Premier of Quebec. Uh, against the separatists, uh, and uh, he came up with an idea called the Council of the Federation, which now becomes the Premier's meeting. Yeah. But if you look at the document, the Council of the Federation, his proposal in the Quebec election, uh, I believe it was 83, uh, it was either 80, uh, uh, I'm trying to remember the dates, uh, 2003, his proposal uh, included the provinces, all provinces, Quebec, Alberta, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, would be involved in all issues dealing with resources. His proposal was the Canadian provinces would deal with all issues with the federal government dealing with international trade. The federal government would deal with the provinces on all issues dealing with the environment. And there was a lot of sensible proposals in there that would, a cooperative federalism that was initiated by a Quebec premier. And if you look at the Western provinces, the resolutions we passed with Ralph Klein and Alan Blakeney and, and uh, Mike Harcourt and later Gordon Campbell, it had exactly the same list of things that provinces should get. If you look at the Western, I actually asked my staff to prepare a grid that yeah. we could present at the premier's meeting because the demands of Quebec for their role in, fed, in, in Canada in the federated state, in the Council of Federations, was exactly the same as the Atlantic Canadian premiers had proposed and the Western Canadian premiers had pr proposed. The only problem is they didn't have a proposal was Ontario, because I guess they didn't think they needed one. Probably true, uh, but uh, it's interesting. So I think the Council of the Federation was a success. I think it's going to be very interesting in this next election. Uh, the Federalist uh, forces have been reduced in Quebec. Uh, the the uh, you know, the separatist party is gained in its popularity, but it is also promising not to have uh, separation as part of their agenda right now. It's kind of interesting, but it's, it's nothing to take for granted. I agree with you. I mean, I think that the way I look at it, Premier, is that there's sort of two aspects to the Quebec issue, one of which is jurisdictional, which, to be honest, I always thought was kind of bullshit because I don't think it resp responds to what's actually going on in Quebec. And the other division is cultural. Like, I've really come to understand, I think, understand, that we're engaged in two different projects. That in English Canada, we are proudly and determinedly building a diverse postmodern type of society that isn't built around ethnicity or language or anything like that. And Quebec is more like a European or a traditional country that defines itself by its language and its ethnicity, and is determined to continue to be defined that way. These are two very different paths. Having said that, and, and it doesn't get none of that gets responded to by who's responsible for labor market training between levels of government. No, I, I think that there's some truth to that, but the bottom line is there's also a great desire outside of Quebec for you know French immersion is way up in Manitoba. Uh, 
but we also have Filipino immersion and we have, uh, you know, I think that's useful. I think it's, you know, I, I know all kinds of families whose kids just themselves raise money to go and take courses in Laval and in Quebec. And they see that and they, they, they see that as an advantage. They, they see it as Europe and Canada. They're actually right. very proud of it. So I, I actually am a little more optimistic about it. But the, it, the, the challenge is actually not between outside Quebec and inside Quebec. The challenge now is inside Quebec, where you may have people making decisions about where to locate based on what, they, what language the kids will learn and have in school. And that's, a, that's an economic issue as well as cultural and obviously very political. Right. That's a very serious issue for a province like, you know, a, a, a cosmopolitan city like Montreal and its role in the world economically. Killing McGill and Concordia is surely not in their interest. And that's right. I agree. Yeah. Stephen Harper appointed yes. you to be ambassador to the United States. I was wondering when you're going to get around to that. Right? Yes. You spent seven years representing Canada in the United States. Why did he want you, and why did you want to represent him? Well, I had a very I, mean, I good find this interesting from a political culture point yeah, of no, view. Yeah, no, I had a very good relationship. I still have a tremendous respect for Prime Minister Harper. I had a very good relationship with the, pri the three prime ministers I work with, the Jean Chrétien, Paul Martin, uh, uh, for a shorter period of time, and, and Prime Minister Harper. Uh, he and I worked together. I am well aware of how long the Martin government lasted. I know you were. I wasn't yeah. going to <laughs> uh, I, uh, I, I got lots of stories about that, but I won't do it repeat them. That's not the question you asked. But uh, he and I worked well together on the floodway expansion, uh, which was really important. We came within a couple of inches after Duff's ditch, you know, almost couldn't hold back the water. Uh, we came to a final agreement with him on that. He had two MPs in his own caucus opposed to it. He he took the public interest in this regard. Uh, I uh, worked with him on the Canadian Museum for Human Rights to make it a national institution. Uh, he had promised Izzy Asper if he was, ever was elected prime minister, he would get, get it done. We used a trilater trilateral approach to that, private sector, public sector, public sector being federal and provincial governments. And now it's a national institution in Winnipeg. We worked together on trade. Uh, uh, when I had a premier, a, a governor from the United States come and visit me, say, to see the polar bears in Churchill. Actually, the, the governor of Arizona, person named Janet Napolitano, came up there. I had to get the parkas, for God's sakes, uh, to go visit the polar bears. I said, and uh, what she wanted to, uh, she made a speech in Winnipeg, and then she wanted to meet the prime minister. I suggested he's a good person to meet. A lot of tourists go to Arizona, you know, very important. A couple months later, she's Homeland Secretary. I always had this belief. My advice to any premier in Western Canada is go to every Western governor's meeting you can go to because today's governor is going to be tomorrow's cabinet minister and yeah. tomorrow's cabinet minister is going to be tomorrow's president. And uh, so I, he knew I had those relationships. And, you know, he also knew, uh, you know, the, the priorities he had for me when he appointed me was uh, – Again, it was in the middle of the financial crisis, but number one was deal with the Buy America. And he knew I knew the unions and they, he knew I knew the governor. Get a, get a legal uh, border agreement. We, be, before, we just had an administrative agreement on each side of the border. We wanted something agreed to uh, with Homeland Security and something agreed to in Parliament and in the Senate here in Canada. The last body to pass it, by the way, is the Senate. Back to my point about abolishing the Senate. And the, uh, I, I digress. Uh, he wanted the Detroit Windsor Bridge. He wanted, uh, uh, you know, a number of priorities. And he and I were on the same, you know, the Gord he named it the Gordie Howe Bridge. It's very important for people from Saskatchewan. It's going to open soon. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's very important for the security of trade across our border. So he and I were on the same page on a lot of things on trade, on Canada-U.S. trade and and I think he knew that. And I really like working with him. I, uh, he's a straight shooter. I like that. I, I always found when I was premier, it was best to deal with decisive people, whether it's cabinet ministers, but it's especially the prime minister. And I had decisive, uh, decisive prime minister with uh, uh, Prime Minister Harper. I certainly had it with Prime Minister Kretchen. And some of the issues with, uh, it was too short a time, as, you, as I mentioned before, for Prime Minister Martin. But, 
Well, that, would be my, that would be my view. I don't know if everybody agrees, but that would be my view. <laughs> <laughs> well, we all had a job to do. I just <laughs> walked up my wing and try to put the puck in the net. The Gordie Howe Bridge will be will, will be at the border, will be open soon, uh, and uh, with a presidential permit, by the way, which is complicated to get these days. Awesome. Listen, everything pales before American politics right now. It's actually hard to focus on the minutia of Canadian politics when everything that matters seems to be on the line down there. With, without asking you to predict election results, what would you say to Canadians who are worried about whether the United States is still the reliable ally, protector, and economic partner we've always thought it to be, always known it to be? Well, I still think it is. And, and you know, there are some issues to deal with. We, we did get an extension of the Softwood Lumber Agreement under Prime Minister Harper, but we never got another one under Prime Minister or President Trump. Uh, we, uh, we, there are trade issues, but we have a lot of allies. The, the governors are actually the main spokespersons for the economy of their states. And we have a lot of jobs in every state. And it's really important. Uh, I think Frank McKenna did a very good job as when he was ambassador of getting around letting people know, the senators know how many jobs are in their states. I think uh, we have a good ambassador in Washington now who helped negotiate the TPP agreement. She's very capable. Uh, she'll be going, uh, sh I'm sure she'll be making sure every senator knows. I, I will, I can't predict the, what's going to happen in the presidency, although I did say last time that Joe Biden is always underestimated uh, in places like Pennsylvania. He's very popular still with the hard hats. Uh, what I would say is the Senate will probably go to the Republicans and uh, the uh, House will probably go to the Democrats. And they do uh, they do have a counter force to whoever's president. Uh, anything, any trade agreement or the ripping up of a trade agreement has to go uh, to the other bodies. And uh, so it's really important. We spend a lot of time on the Hill. We've got the best viewing place on the hill where we're center ice between the white house and the congressional building uh, and the canadian embassy so we got to keep at it and we've got to keep at it from all uh you know it's got to be hard-nosed discussions because uh when trump tried to rip up nafta first a guy named sonny purdue the governor of georgia a person who many of us dealt with when he was governor of georgia uh he was a, he took a map of canada and how many places were customers or u.s farmers and that sort of halted President Trump. So those are the kind of messages we got to get before somebody gets to the big office. Uh, and, you know, I think uh, uh, Wab Canoe has already announced that he's going to go to Washington. I'm his volunteer um, uh, trade ambassador uh, or trade, trade representative. So I'll, I'll, there are a number of us will be joining him. And, uh, he'll, you know, he, I think he'll have a very good mission and he'll be you know, with the embassy helping them out and uh, helping us out. But I think we've got to keep, uh, you know, when people have a foreign visit uh, to some place, well, I'm not going to mention any place, but, you know, some place you want to visit, you know, you, you know, you shouldn't have a foreign visit as a premier or as a business representative anywhere else but Washington right now, because that's 70% of our trade. You might want to see a, a different restaurant in some different country, but not part of your job. <laughs> very interesting. I hope, very interesting. I hope people in Saskatchewan government are listening. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> I know the story. They're jetting okay. all over the they're jetting all over the place right now. Listen, you have <laughs> remained so popular in Manitoba that Wab Canoe announcing you as an advisor was a campaign event. Yes, it, it was. It was a campaign event to start to establish their economic credibility. So thank you to you for taking the time to do this. I really appreciate being able to talk to you, Premier. It's You've got a tremendous sense of the politics of this country, a tremendous sense of what makes it work and what makes it successful. And I uh, appreciate you sharing that with people today. Well, I'll say hello to Jenny for you. Please and, do that. Uh, Please she'll tell I... me some more stories about your travels in the southern United States. Oh, my God. Ask her about Jesse Helms' pig roast. That was quite something. Wow. Uh, we still have a better law with Cuba than uh, Helms developed in the United States. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> Absolutely. Listen, thank you for doing this. I want to thank our presenting sponsor, TELUS, and our sponsor, CN Rail. Everybody who watched or listened to the show, thank you. And uh, we'll be back next week with more of the Hurley Burley. 
Uh, take care of yourself, Premier. Thumbs up, David. Burly, burly. Burly, burly.